Good afternoon. I'm Beetle. I'm one of the geeks that launched the AWS security team nine years ago. This is FND313-L, a leadership session in foundational security, and I have several fantastic co-presenters. They're listed here, but I will also be introducing them as they join me shortly. So welcome to Boston. I'm super excited that we chose Boston as the first place for AWS Reinforce. If you've been in this town, there are a number of things to do. Uh, make sure you check out the Museum of Science, grab yourself a lobster roll, a lot of historic things to do, Bunker Hill, USS Constitution. Additionally, in Boston, when they say MFA, they're not talking about multi-factor authentication. They're talking about the Museum of Fine Arts, and you can spend a lot of time there. I have, it's a great place to go. I love this city. I visit regularly, mostly because of that place down there in the lower right hand corner, <laughs> Fenway Park. So that's home of my favorite baseball team, uh, the World Series champions from 2018, nine time World Series champions, thank you. The Boston Red Sox. So Fenway happens to be the oldest major league ballpark. It was opened in 1912. And if you're a fan of baseball, uh, like I am, or you've just not been to a really awesome ballpark, you should absolutely catch a game there. Now, we're not just talking about Boston and baseball today. We do have an agenda. I'm going to be giving you information not only about this talk, but also about this track and how it's going to help you. And my talented co-presenters will be getting into the finer details of a number of different sections. First, we'll be talking about architectures, frameworks, guidance that you can use, what I like to call the foundation of the foundation, things that will help you get started on your security journey. Additionally, we'll be providing professional tips, more than just tips and tricks, tactical advice that you can use right now, things that you might even have to do right now, so if you have Wi-Fi, taking steps that will actually increase your security posture in your AWS environment. We'll also be talking about resources at the ready, whether it's talent or tools you can actually bring into your workspace to help you achieve your security goals. And along the way, I'm probably going to talk about baseball. So AWS already has an awesome tie to baseball. Who here has watched a baseball game that has StatCast AI powered by AWS? It's awesome stuff, right? Get to watch somebody actually hit a ball, see the visuals of entry velocity, exit velocity, direction of the ball, distance, see where it actually lands, see calculation of probability as to whether or not somebody can catch a ball or whether they would have caught the ball. Some of that stuff is amazing. This year, in particular, I'm super excited about the real-time success probability calculation for stolen bases. And so if you're watching a baseball game on TV and you see StatCast AI and it's powered by AWS, it's the future. And I'm really happy that it's being applied to baseball and that AWS is involved with it. But long before there was StatCast, in June of 1941, the great Ted Williams hit a 502-foot home run in Fenway Park. It was the longest home run recorded there. Now, the fan who was hit directly on the head by that home run ball, was sitting 33 rows up in the right field bleachers. And he exclaimed afterwards in an interview, how far away must one sit to be safe in this park? <laughs> now, if you get a chance to actually visit Fenway, you can actually find the lone red seat that commemorates that legendary feat. And I've actually gone there and tried to imagine the StatCast AI visuals of that home run if it were actually hit today. Now, Red Sox fans recognize that Ted Williams was the greatest hitter to ever live. And his jersey number nine is long been retired at Fenway. And he was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame long before that. You can Google all of the amazing stats, but the one thing that he's most recognized for today is that he was the last player to average 400 in a batting season. Now, 40% of the time when that man stepped into a batting box, he had a successful hit. 
He was a legend, but he had this to say about the profession that he loved. Now apply that to our profession. <laughs> apply that to the work challenges that you have today. If you were successful at protecting your infrastructure, your customers' data, 30% of the time, would you be considered good at your job? So there's a percentage that we probably have to strive for that's higher than that, right? But it's a continuous battle. And there's a balance that we actually have to strike as well. So we're trying to protect all of our infrastructure, where an adversary has to find one weakness that they're going to take advantage of. It's pretty daunting. And when we're defending that infrastructure, we have to think, what are, the, what are the balances that we're going to have to strike? What are the trade-offs that we're going to have to make? Because we've all heard the jokes about a totally secure system, right? If it's 100% secure, it's probably not going to be too usable. So oftentimes, we're trying to make sure that even though we're striving for perfection, that we're not letting perfection become the enemy of the good. So what is good? How do we know what good is? And who tells us what good is? Who guides us there? So I like to think that the foundation track is all about what is core to getting good at securing your AWS environment. Now, we have a number of other tracks. I was fortunate enough to be involved in the brainstorming for this conference, and so I got to define the tracks. So governance, risk, and compliance, pretty straightforward. Wrangling your stuff, understanding how you can achieve security goals, the ones that are actually imposed upon you from external forces, the things that somebody wants you to check off that says you're secure, but what you're doing is meeting compliance. And we have to do that. It enables the business, right? But we've got a track solely dedicated to that. Then there's security dive deep. I like to think of this as raising your internal security bar, going from good to striving for excellence. And there's a lot of automation that actually comes into play when we start doing that in an AWS environment. And you've seen some of the presentations at reInvent, hopefully, where we've talked about using automation to improve your security posture, awareness, response. Then there's security pioneers. What I like to think of as opening your eyes, challenging yourself, becoming inspired, finding out what other customers are doing on the platform and how they're inventing security solutions. But that doesn't mean that the foundations track is just a basics track. It doesn't mean that this is just the eat your vegetables track. I like to think that the foundation is about structured approaches, immediately applicable instructions, and instantly available resources that reinforce your security mission and help you achieve those security goals. So back to baseball. When you're watching baseball, you're seeing players play the game. But there's organization and there's order that's actually at work there. There's fundamentals and there's strategy that are being executed. And generally speaking, there's somebody that's coaching that. They're doing that at the direction of a coach. Somebody who has that strategy, who has that plan, who is sharing it and executing ideally towards success. Now, when we're talking about coaching on the AWS platform, using the environment, where can you go to get that coaching? Some of it's pretty obvious, right? Documentation. And yeah, you could spend a lot of time reading documentation. There's a lot of services. And just recently, we announced uh, we've added security-specific sections to 37 different services, so it's much easier for you to find the security-relevant information specific to those services. So I know a lot of times you look at that URL and you're like, documentation. But take another look, because we're starting to focus some of that information for you, starting to consolidate it so it's easier for you to find. Compliance resources. Again, compliance might be a list of things that are being imposed upon you that you have to achieve, but sometimes those things don't make sense, and we need somebody to help make sense of it for us. 
And so you should check out our compliance resources and our documentation oriented there, which will help you understand more about a particular compliance regime and how you can achieve those particular compliance controls in our environment. And then there's external resources, industry guides that you can use. The Cloud Security Alliance has plenty of guidance for you. Plenty of coaching exists, not just from AWS, from, but also from outside resources. Great coaching is fundamental to becoming great yourself. And so here to speak more about the coaching that AWS provides to its customers, guidance that goes well beyond our documentation is the lead for our well-architected efforts, FITS, or as we know him, FITS. <laughs> Please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Imagine as you start your cloud journey, if you had access to the knowledge of those who'd gone before you and been successful. I'll just stand here. And it's customary when you go on a grand adventure to be given an object that helps you to be successful. In Nintendo Zelda, you are often offered a sword. Maybe today it should be a baseball bat. Baseball. Now in Zelda, the most powerful object that was available to you was the Triforce. And as you embark on your cloud journey, we have a Triforce of three frameworks to help you. In this section, we're going to talk about these three frameworks. We're going to talk about the NIST cybersecurity framework, the AWS cloud adoption framework, and finally, the AWS well-architected framework. Let's visualize how we can use those frameworks together. As I've mentioned, these frameworks work together to help you on your journey, and they are complementary. And when we think about how to use these frameworks, I like to visualize it in this way. Where in the journey does the framework help you? And how specific in implementation detail is the framework? Now, of course, like all visualizations, it's probably wrong. But it's to give you an idea of how to think about when and how to use these frameworks. So the NIST cybersecurity framework helps you throughout the journey. But it's not specific in the implementation detail. It's general advice. And this cybersecurity framework is about learning and adopting cybersecurity best practices. We also have the AWS cloud adoption framework. And this helps you as you move towards the cloud. And that's why it's on the left-hand side. And it focuses on your organization. You can use CAF to help you prepare as you move to the cloud. So it helps you to envisage the business outcomes you're trying to achieve and the KPI and metrics you're going to need to measure and monitor to ensure success. It helps you to align your stakeholders and build a plan that ensures you deliver for everybody. And as you launch your cloud projects, it helps you to realize value and to manage that ongoing cloud journey. The well-architected framework helps you build and operate in the cloud. So that's why it's on the right-hand side of the journey. And it focuses on the workloads that you are architecting. So in well-architected, we often talk about the concept of workloads. These are the things that you build that deliver a particular business value. So they might be your ERP system or your CRM, or they might be your marketing website. You can use Well Architected to learn the strategies and best practices for architecting in the cloud. It helps you to measure your architecture against best practices. And I think this is probably one of the unique selling points of using Well Architected. It's given you, for the first time, a mechanism to gain a measure of how good an architecture is. And when you review an architecture and you measure it, we also help you work out how to improve that architecture by addressing any issues that you find. Now, we recommend that you use all three frameworks together. And to try and make that as easy as possible, 
we try to ensure that we align the terminology across them. There are some differences. Of course, the frameworks have a slight tension between them, but ultimately they do work together to help you to understand how to go through your cloud journey and the appropriate processes and strategies to use. So at its heart, Well Architected provides you a process for reviewing your architecture across five foundational areas. And when I talk about Well Architected, I often like to talk about an analogy. So when you're thinking about creating technology solutions, in some ways, it's a lot like constructing physical buildings. If the foundations of a building are not solid and stable, it can be hard for that building to be safe and secure, and frankly, for it to deliver on the intent of its purpose. So for example, as a conference center, if we didn't feel like it was safe in here, you probably would find it hard to pay attention to sessions. Now, when you do apply these five areas to your technology solutions, you can build stable and secure solutions. And we think about that in terms of operational excellence, in terms of how do I have teams and processes and design my system so they are easy and safe to operate? In terms of security, how do I make sure that the system has thought about security from all those different aspects? Reliability, how do I make sure that this system is available and copes with failures and what happens after failure? And then in terms of performance, how do I deliver the performance that is necessary to deliver business value? whilst at the same time managing and maintaining costs. And the five together help you to think about your architecture in a holistic fashion. So by following the framework, you also will have a consistent process for reviewing architectures. Who here has an architecture review process when they launch something into production? Put your hands up. Is that a consistent process? OK, it's one of the hardest things is having a consistent process especially if the person reviewing your architecture has their team lose a sports game the night before. So having this consistent process will help you to review your architectures and make sure you address the areas that people often neglect. And crucially, one of the things we see is that it helps you document the design decisions and the risks that are in your technology portfolio that your business depends upon. So when I talk to customers about Well Architected, they may ask me, you know, why should I use Well Architected? And starting with why is a, a very powerful technique. Um, and the conversations I've had with customers who have used Well Architected uh, bring out a few things. Uh, I think it was Mark Twain who said that history doesn't repeat, but it sure does rhyme. Um, this is a similar case. So uh, customers find that they can build and deploy faster because the Well Architected framework helps them to think about and focusing on automation. It helps them to lower risk because they can make informed decisions about where to invest resources. One of the things I've seen customers, especially technology teams, be really successful with is when they involve their business in being well architected and reviewing architectures, it helps the business understand why you care about these things. Because they view a framework which is from somebody else as being independent, kind of like the consulting effect, it allows them to understand why these issues matter and helps them to make the appropriate decisions about where to invest resources. And finally, it helps you to learn the best practices that we've curated. So as solutions architects, support, or technical account managers, or professional services consultants, we talk to many, many customers. And when we find emergent best practices, we try and codify them into the frameworks to provide you with the kind of access to the knowledge of those who have gone before you and be successful in one place. So for Well Architected, we provide the following. We provide resources to learn best practices, such as white papers, free training, as well as hands-on labs. And we also have the AWS Well Architected tool, which is available in the AWS console at no charge, which allows you to review your workloads where you can manage and report on risks and get guidance on how to improve that architecture. One of the things I've seen technology uh, teams also do with Well Architected is use the Well Architected tool 
to demonstrate back to the business the improvements they are making to their systems. Often it can be difficult to explain to the business team what the technology team is doing with all their time. And so what some customers have been using is a feature in Well Architected where you can create milestones to demonstrate key points in the architecture as they improve it, and they can then use that to explain back to the business how they have improved their architectures, which obviously makes conversations around additional resourcing and your priorities much easier to have. And we also have select APN partners. So these are partners who can review a workload and provide you with a statement of work of how the architecture can be improved. Now, as busy customers, we always are working hard to deliver what we want for our end customers. And so it's hard sometimes to have the, the priority or the resources to do things. So using an APN partner in this way can help you to address some things that maybe you don't have the spare resources or the spare skills to address. And so those partners will provide you with a statement of work and if you accept that statement of work, AWS will provide you with $5,000 worth of AWS credits to offset the cost, because we want to see you improve your architectures, because that will lead to better outcomes for you. And with that, I just wanted to call out that we have some more um, things that you can do uh, in the sessions here. We have some lounges outside that you can go visit, and you can access experts who can tell you about uh, these different frameworks as well as we have uh, areas where you can uh, have a go at some of the hands-on labs. And we also have some fun arcade competitions where you can win some Star Wars robots. So um, later on, when you need to power up, get some more uh, information on what architected, please come find us, and we'd love to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks. Nice. Thanks, Fitz. Awesome. So related breakouts. If you're looking for more information regarding Well Architected or looking at aspects of your AWS journey that need some guidance, some coaching, check out Securing Your Workloads in the Cloud, Best Practices for Using AWS Well Architected Framework tomorrow midday. Also, Security Cartography, Assembling the Building Blocks Needed for Cloud Security tomorrow afternoon. And for anyone who's in the .gov or .mil space, and is looking for essentially the guidance that you might need to meet some controls in an AWS environment, uh, look at aligning to the NIST cybersecurity framework in the AWS cloud. But back to baseball. Ted Williams had 521 home runs in his career. He was two-time Triple Crown winner, which means for the American League, for two seasons, he led in home runs, batting average, and RBIs. He was a 17-time All-Star pick. And again, he was the last player to hit 400. Now, you can imagine Ted had a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, probably a lot of people that he was playing against that would have liked him to have shared in that knowledge and that experience. Ted actually wrote a book after he was out of baseball called The Science of Hitting. And it was chock full of advice for baseball players who want to improve their hitting. Interestingly enough, Ted's book is actually built upon advice that he received from another baseball legend, Roger Hornsby, who said, to be a good hitter, you've got to do one thing, get a good ball to hit. Now, that sounds pretty obvious, right? But sometimes it's the advice that we get from other players that seems obvious once it's said to you, but you weren't thinking about it, a professional tip something that you hadn't been paying attention to. And when we're talking about your AWS environment, where are you going to get those pro tips? Where are they and who's providing them? Well, naturally, we have a number of resources that have almost always been there. AWS Developer Forums, where you can go and ask a question. An AWS Cloud Engineer will respond with an answer. Or another customer who's also had that problem and maybe even solved it, can reply with an answer as well. There's the AWS Security Blog, where we're publishing about security-related features and services, providing tutorials, guest authors that are sharing their information. And then if you YouTube search AWS reInvent Security, 
you'll find a number of previous reInvent videos that are presentations, some of them I happen to be in even, that talk about how to accomplish certain things in an AWS environment. Intrusion detection in the cloud, incident response in the cloud, automating your security response awareness. We accelerate our growth by learning from teammates and from the observations and shared experience that come from even other players' teams. We're really fortunate that we actually have so many naturally curious customers who keep up with our launch pace, who regularly explore and experiment with AWS, and their voices end up reinforcing all sorts of groovy things that we're doing, but they're sharing their experience and they're helping other customers get up to speed quickly. I'm very pleased that one of those helpful voices actually agreed to join us today to share some of those tactical tips. A professional who doesn't work for AWS, but is very, very kind to actually share some knowledge with our customers. Corey Quinn from the Last Week in AWS blog and newsletter, please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here. I will not be torturing a baseball metaphor to death for you all. My commitment to fitness extends pretty much to fitness entire burrito in my mouth. That's as far as I go. It's not a dad bod, it's a father figure. As he mentioned, <laughs> I do not work for AWS because they have what are known as hiring standards. I'm a cloud economist, two words that no one can define, because, uh, so I wind up not getting called on it. Cloud, a bunch of other people's computers. An economist, someone who claims to know about, mo blah, blah, about money, but dresses instead like a flood victim. Instead, I spend most of my time fixing large and confusing cloud bills for most of my customers. And that's aligned with security very intrinsically because it all comes down to a, almost a trailing function. It's never a priority until suddenly it is. For once, here at this conference, we'd like to address that a little bit. And what I'm here to give you is not a list of high-level strategic things to think about, but things that you can wind up addressing right now. To be very clear, these are mine. As mentioned, I do not work for AWS, which has led to some fascinating conversations as we built out this entire talk. Uh, I am sure that they will not repeat the mistake of inviting me to speak ever again. So I'm, I'm going to take advantage of it while I can. I have seven things to tell you. We're going to start with number one. Uh, if you're like most companies, you're going to have e the email address for your primary AWS account going to your founder's inbox, because once upon a time, that's what they registered. The same email address that goes to their Amazon.com account where they get all the notifications for underpants. That's great. If you go into the master, uh, master accounts system, you can adjust, adjust immediately where the security contact is. That address is not real. Don't bother waking me up at 2 in the morning. It's security. I don't sleep. I wait. The, what this does is it is effectively point this at your knock. Point this to the people who are on call. Point this at the people who are going to be actioned to fix things. They don't use this for marketing. But when they see an abusive pattern or they see something they want to talk to someone about, this is what they use. And fundamentally, making it easy to get in touch when there's a security issue is just a good practice. The second thing I'd like to talk about is about enabling CloudTrail in every region. This used to be somewhat painful and manual. It's not anymore. If you go into the master account, you can apply the trail to all regions. Awesome. You can also forcibly propagate it to everything else in that organization, all the different AWS accounts. It's two clicks. Point it to an S3 bucket. Let's talk a little bit about that S3 bucket. For starters, you probably don't want to leave it public, but that's not the interesting part. What is, is first, put that bucket in a separate unlinked account. That way, you can wind up sending it somewhere central that isn't directly under the auspices of the accounts that it's logging. And then restrict who has access to that entire account, let alone the bucket, to the smallest possible number of people because this is going to be the forensic trail that you're going to want to use. Otherwise, the only thing it's going to show in the event of an incident is step one, someone turned off CloudTrail. Step two, there really is no step two, and now you're playing guesswork. Awesome. It's a whodunit murder mystery with no clues. Doesn't everyone love that? You're also going to want to enable versioning in case someone inadvertently messes something up. They shouldn't change once they're written, so this really should have no impact, but it's a nice safeguard. On top of that, go ahead and enable MFA delete so that if someone wants to delete something, they have to authenticate and be incredibly intentional about it. 
And that takes care of that. The third thing, not a sales pitch, I promise. Turn on guard duty. It just makes sense, and you're not going to be able to build this on your own. As was mentioned in the keynote today, what this is is a service that grabs all kinds of different data points, internal to AWS and external from third-party partners, and distills this down to things that are actionable. Once you turn off the noisy parts that uh, don't necessarily apply to what you're doing, it provides a very useful tool to give you intelligence you're not going to be able to gather anywhere else. Turn it on, you get the first 30 days for free so you can see what it costs and validate that it has value. I'd be surprised if it didn't. If it doesn't, let me know. I'd love to hear that story. The fourth thing you can do is they announced this feature late last year of Amazon S3 block public access. And what this means is that you can't make objects or buckets that contain those, bu those objects publicly accessible, which is awesome for an awful lot of things like database backups, for example. Now, there are some caveats to this to be aware of before you right now go in on the Wi-Fi and turn this on that I want to address because you will absolutely realize that this breaks things right after you've broken them hilariously. Ask me how I know. You can enable it on a going forward basis, so only new buckets have this applied to them. That's great. For extra empathy bonus points, maybe tell your developers that you're doing this so they don't wind up tearing their hair out. Well, this worked before. Why doesn't it work now? It, that, that does not win you points at the company holiday party. You can also, if you want to use a static site, which is a valid use case for S3, if you drop CloudFront in front of a bucket, you can restrict access to those objects just to that CloudFront distribution, which is awesome. This means that you shuts off all of those ridiculous warnings of, oh, this bucket is open, because it's not. There are cases where you want things to be publicly accessible, but this gets you a few additional uh, capabilities, and it's usually worth pursuing. That's what I did just to make all the lights turn green, which is really what we, how we think about security in some places. You can also take the public buckets that you need and migrate those over to a different account because there should be a few use cases where it does make sense for this. Keep that somewhere separate, and that thing can have public access turned on. That's great. Everything else, now you know that the stuff that has your important user data is not going to be hanging out there on the internet for people to look at. It's just a good practice. This one uh, is sort of evolving as time goes on, because once upon a time, there were different ways of authenticating different applications. Uh, we're going to go from most crappy to least crappy in a relatively short order. The first one, of course, is doing nothing at all and just letting everything do whatever it wants, because people are basically honest. <laughs> Let me know how that works out for you. The easy way to do it is to bake username and credential pairs in your application, which we all should know by now if we're sitting in this room. Don't do that. The next step that people are starting to move towards is great, IAM credentials, where you get an access key and a secret key, and the combination of those two grants access. And baking that in is still not a terrific idea. What we see longer term now is using IAM roles that are narrowly scoped per application. So if you have an application that just needs to talk to that one S3 bucket, you can restrict that. Under the hood, what it's doing as an execution role for Lambda or an instance role for EC2 is it's rotating credential pairs under the hood uh, in a very short time window. So even if someone gets into a box and pulls the credential pair out, it has a very limited window of validity. And that's the point. This is stuff you don't have to think about. Every reasonable API and most unreasonable ones that have an SDK for this stuff already know how to deal with this. It should require no code changes. Test it, but it's a best practice. We've all heard, as security folks, about the benefits of using multi-factor authentication. So I'm not going to rehash that for you now. Instead, I'm going to tell you some multi-factor trivia that you may or may not have noticed over the past mm, year or so. For starters, you can now use YubiKeys to authenticate to the console. If you have a YubiKey, you probably understand why that's a big deal. If you're not, get one. It'll change your life. Also, does anyone know what the plural of YubiKey is? It's not YubiKeys, that's a typo. The correct pluralization is YulbiKey. We learned that from our friends south, a little further south. I'm not apologizing for that one either. You can also turn on MFA for API access, meaning if you're using the CLI or you have a, a, another system that winds up reaching out to an AWS API, you can, return, you can turn on MFA. Well, that sounds highly frictionful and super annoying for an application. Why would I do that? 
Well, you can do that on a per API call basis. Things you don't do very often, such as deleting a database snapshot. That's probably something you want to be a little bit more intentional about. So the destructive, angry things that are going to cause problems for you, this winds up being a great way of gating that and making sure that people are really sure. Think of this not just as authenticating someone's identity, but having the pop-up box, are you sure you want to do that? Uh, it's a less annoying version of Clippy if we want to go in that direction. And you can also start uh, reducing the friction as well. Have an account without MFA turned on if you want, where you can do all the read-only access stuff you want, but then have to assume a role that requires authentication with that multi-factor aspect before you start breaking things. For those of us who give demos from time to time that shouldn't need to write anything, it's easier to have a role ready to go or on a mobile device where we can just see what's going on that doesn't require fumbling around with access tokens and the rest. It's easier. It's about making life better instead of worse. And if you're into it, things like there are third-party solutions like Duo or Okta that are terrific at integrating with this as well, so you don't have to manage it all yourself. There are other partners in this space that do well. AWS gives you the tools to do it yourself. Choose your own adventure. It also turns out that doing these things will result in a better outcome. Uh, as a cloud economist, I can assure you it is totally economical to mine cryptocurrency in the cloud. The only caveat is if you have to use someone else's account to do it. Don't let it be yours. Or do. The choice is your own. And the seventh thing I want to talk about is AWS organizations. Also not a sales pitch, but it winds up shaping how we think about cloud. For starters, organizations didn't exist once upon a time. The idea was, oh, you get a single AWS account. And that's, that was the best practice in 2010, back when I started playing with this. Some of us never evolved past that until we were forced to. And this had some problems tied to it. Now the best practice is to have a separate AWS account. It, and organizations make this easier. It all bills to the same place. It lets you extend security controls, et cetera. And we'll get into some of that. But all in all, it is a best practice to investigate using this. In fact, if you can start treating accounts as something you can create quickly, test something out in, and then destroy it, that opens up interesting possibilities. You're pretty sure you can bootstrap your application from nothing, but why not spin it up in a toy account, make sure that you can do it with nothing in there, and, and that there's not something you have to go into the console and mess around with. And when you're done doing an experiment or possibly working with something destructive, blow away the entire account and call it a day. Something else you learn the fun way in most cases is that rate limits are very much on a per account basis. Now, when you have everyone using one AWS account, that's great. Someone in development with a loop stuck somewhere can cause production to go down when rate limits get exhausted. Less uh, naively, you can have particular applications or different microservices that comprise an application where one of them starts to exhaust a rate limit and that has a negative effect on the rest of the application. Since these are tied per account, this lets you start breaking those out. With the release of service quotas yesterday, this now becomes something you can take in at a glance and start applying templates for limit requests to those other accounts as they get provisioned. It also is, finance is one of those interesting groups where they don't tend to speak the same language as engineering or security or operations. So if you wind up being able to say, everything in this account is for this service and it's in production, that checks a box and they will not darken your doorstep until the next billing period, which is great. You'd, rather than having to slice and dice the contents of individual accounts, if you can set this up in such a way that your accounts align with cost centers, they're going to be way happier, and generally you're going to be way happier as a direct result of having to talk to those people less. Now, this is a security conference, so I want to talk a little bit about the security bits of organizations, which is worth taking the time to dive into a smidgen. For starters, Control Tower, which went GA late last night and was announced this morning, it makes working with these things way, way easier. It used to be a fair bit of manual work and making sure everything was configured correctly with Landing Zone. Now Control Tower mostly automates that away. It's not going to be a fit for everyone. There are folks who want to be very hands-on in how they're working with their various accounts, and you can still do that, but this provides a series of sensible defaults in a controlled, repeatable way that aligns with best practices. The best kind of, uh, of implementation of a best practice is one you can just throw over the wall for someone else to worry about, and it's one of those undifferentiated heavy lifting aspects. There's also something that doesn't get enough attention, which is service control policies, which you can set throughout an organization. Things such as 
Any account that gets spun up within this organization has to have CloudTrail turned on and cannot turn it off, regardless of whether it's the root account in that account or not. This is how you start forcing very fine-grained requirements from a compliance and guardrail perspective into any account. So when you have a, a developer who wants to test something out, you can spin up an account for that person and then very rapidly get to a point where the guardrails make it easy to do the right thing rather than hard. This is the challenge, as we see across the board with cloud governance, is it's, it, security can no longer afford to be the department of no. It has to be empowering, and it has to be almost in the background. And that's fundamentally what aligns, from my perspective, with cost and security, in that it's easy to spin up a separate account outside of the auspices of governance. Shadow IT has never been easier. The only way you get around that is by making it easier to wind up doing things the right way than not doing things the right way. And by getting, so leveraging some of these tools, you gain better visibility, you gain a better security posture, and you get way better answers for auditors, which frankly, for an awful lot of security folks, that's the important part of the story. If you've enjoyed my ridiculous take on these things and droll sense of humor, I write a sarcastic newsletter every week and host a podcast where I interview smart people and they make me look smart just by standing next to them and talk about interesting things in the world of cloud. I'm Corey Quinn. Thank you for listening to me. Awesome. Raise your hand if you learned something from Corey today. Awesome. So related breakouts, professional tips, stuff that you can start using right now uh, as you're executing on your journey. Fundamentals of AWS Cloud Security, make sure you catch this tomorrow morning, eight to nine. It's gonna be a hoot. Best practices for choosing identity solutions for applications and workloads, a little bit more specific, but again, tactical guidance that you need. And then in addition to that, if you want hands-on experience, an opportunity to actually geek out with teammates and against other teams, check out the Security Jam or check out the Capture the Flag competition. Back to baseball. Now, Ted Williams was a legend. He was the greatest hitter who ever lived. He had unbelievable individual statistics. But you know what? Ted Williams never won a World Series. We talk about teams winning World, World Series because that's what it takes. It takes the right mix of players, hitting, pitching, running, fielding. Sometimes we don't get the right mix of team members, and we need to move players around, or we need to bring in additional resources, like a relief pitcher, to close out a game and bring home the win. And yes, even a diehard Red Sox fan like myself can recognize that Mo Rivera was the greatest closer despite all the grief he gave us as a Yankee. <laughs> but where do we get those reinforcements for our AWS environment? Some of these are pretty obvious, and they've been there for quite some time. But make sure you're using them. AWS support. That's where you go if you have an issue. Engage support if you have it, and you have it. And remember, if they don't have the answer for you, whether it's in immediate instructions or their own runbook and helping you solve an issue, they have procedures to escalate to the internal team that will be able to help you. AWS Professional Services, where you can hire Amazonians to come to you physically, logically, to help you build with you solving your particular challenges, security or otherwise. And then if you look externally, Open source, free solutions, a good example, threat response suite. You need automated incident response at scale. A thousand EC2 instances that you'd like to grab memory and disk, shove all of that into a forensics environment, have it start auto-analyzing auto all of that for you, done, free. Just like the pros have specific position players, designated hitters, even relief pitchers, AWS customers have a bench and a bullpen that they actually can draw upon as well. And here to speak more about that capability pool of AWS partners who can actually pitch, hit, and run for you is Rohit Gupta. He leads our global partner segment for security. Please welcome Rohit to the stage.
Thanks, Beetle. Thanks for having me here. So yes, uh, the partner equation. Clearly, there are lots of things that you are required to do and can do. And as you learned today, uh, there are things you should be doing. And, and we uh, have a, a whole lot of partners who actually help uh, make that easier for you. But where do they fit in? So starting with the shared responsibility model, I'd like to use this slide to sort of explain uh, you're all familiar with the, the idea that you, know, you have responsibilities in the cloud. Uh, AWS, Beetle's team, uh, does a great job of, of securing the infrastructure that we operate ourselves and, uh, and really are looking at below the line uh, security all the time, making sure that we alert you through some of the mechanisms he talked about on a regular basis if there's an issue. But your responsibilities really are, are above the line and, and making sure that you are setting up your, your infrastructure correctly and, and managing to it. And that's really where our partners play. Uh, they take some of the heavy lifting um, away from you, and so they can automate that, they can monitor it, they can alert you as well uh, when things go awry. And so that's really where they are helping. It's all above the line. Clearly, we use partner solutions inside of our infrastructure as well, but you don't have access to that. That is operated by us. But where you do have access to deploy what you want and, and have them help you is really above the line. And so we operate a, a large organization uh, that manages all our partners. We call that the APN, the AWS Partner Network. And really, the, the basic idea is that we are working with a very large community of partners, many of whom are on the show floor here, uh, and, and ensuring that they are following best practices as well. Uh, clearly, you know, there are a lot more companies who have been working in the security space uh, and in other areas, storage, networking, and such. Uh, but we are really trying to identify the best partners for you. Uh, just to give you some numbers, uh, we've added tens of thousands of partners just last year alone. So uh, what you are wondering is, you know, this organization is growing. I have so many partners to choose from for my particular needs. How do I find the best partners? And so what we have done is actually created the AWS Competency Program, which is really designed uh, to help you identify from those tens of thousands of partners the best ones. And it's not just uh, in one area by industry, uh, by solution, by the different workload types. So security clearly is one of those competencies, but there are others. And some of our partners will have multiple competencies as well. So if you, you know, somebody might be financial services and security, it's a common use case, or healthcare and security, another common use case. So you can pick the partners that really uh, uh, you know, satisfy what you're looking for, but these are the ones that are the best we have. So you start from the, the list that I had earlier, but you can really narrow it down to what you want. And so let's talk about security. So the security partners uh, are really vetted even more uh, than the other competencies because it's such an important and critical function. So we have a team that, that analyzes all of the different uh, solutions that a partner has, makes sure that they're well architected, they make sure that they are uh, actually deployed successfully in customer accounts. So when we are telling you these partners have competency, we have tested them, we have deployed them ourselves, we have spoken to customers who have deployed them and are happy. So those are all requirements for them to pass this process. And then they have references that we check with them and uh, make sure that they deploy cleanly and, and are automated as much as possible. So what you get from this program is really our best of the best partners. And, and those are identified as well on the show floor with the logo of security competency. So let's look at some of the, the names of the partners. And I think there are some in the room here as well, I, I see. So we, can, we break them out by different categories. Uh, so you can find infrastructure security is obviously a very big one. We have a lot of partners there, uh, companies that do things like firewall and IDS. Um, are, are, you know, on the, the left side, identity and access management, which is another big area. Uh, of, a lot of our customers uh, utilize uh, solutions from their companies, uh, like Okta, um, are, are common use cases. Uh, but also, um, they run on AWS, so that's a particularly good one. Uh, we have other examples uh, in the data protection space, configuration vulnerability assessment, uh, has a bunch of partners as well. Logging and monitoring is another use case. Uh, that we see a lot. So, so these are some examples of product companies uh, that are building solutions optimized for AWS, are deployed successfully. And I think uh, you might find that some of the uh, companies you use on your on-premises environment are also available uh, in the cloud. 
so you can actually continue to use what you have been using uh, on-prem. We don't stop there. We actually have a consulting um, competency program as well. So these are partners, as Beetle was saying, you want to hire a specialist because you don't have the right people, or if somebody leaves, or if you're expanding and you don't, you don't have enough capacity on the team uh, to help you manage it. These companies have also been vetted through a similar process, but they've been vetted for their ability to deliver solutions in those different categories. Security engineering, governance risk and compliance, automation, and so on. And so again, these are companies, uh, some of them are the big names you might recognize, but also uh, smaller companies uh, that are specializing in security and delivering these uh, in the local market. We have companies, for example, in Japan as well, uh, who are delivering these services to our customers. So you can go find the, the right solution that you need um, and, and the partner to deliver it. So let's talk a little bit about how you actually f can, can use these and, and do it yourself as well. So we have partner solutions that are available through AWS Marketplace. Just like you install an AWS service into your account, you can actually install a partner solution as well. So you can actually go into our Marketplace and find solutions by different categories. Security is obviously one of the, the leading categories in, in AWS Marketplace. And I thought, you know, who's going to buy security without talking to someone? Turns out that's our number one deployed solution category in AWS Marketplace. People are buying it. It actually works. And, and it's been for a long time. So I would encourage you to check it out there. Uh, you can, of course, buy it through a variety of different models, uh, you know, pay as you go. You can do contracts. You can do whatever suits your needs through Marketplace and deploy immediately. We see a lot of solutions, uh, you know, it comes to release time, you haven't got the right security infrastructure in place, you can quickly go into Marketplace, find and deploy a solution without having to talk to anyone. And that's a common practice as well. So you can find the category, uh, it's broken out, and we also list out in the Marketplace those solutions that have security competency. Uh, so you can find the best solutions. Of course, you, know, you might find that a partner has not applied for competency, but they still have a very good solution. You can look at reviews uh, in Marketplace. So you can look at what other people have said. Just like buying on Amazon.com, you can just buy software like that. And, and like I said, you know, people are, are, are happy with the, the speed, simplicity, and scalability of this approach of, of AWS Marketplace. It has been a, uh, really a game changer. What we have found now is bringing Amazon.com style purchasing options to software, and especially you know, complex software like security. Uh, we really try to simplify that process, and customers love it. I mean, you look at some of the names of the, on the slide, you've got Simple Pay, you've got Goodwill, uh, and MakerBot that, that um, have purchased, and literally uh, we have, I think, over 200,000 active subscriptions right now uh, through Marketplace. So it's a very, very uh, fast growing and, and big part of our business. So really, you know, uh, I want to leave this slide up. Um, Beetle talked about specialization. Yes, our partners are specialists. They're delivering outcomes that matter, that, that are useful to you. Uh, you can start your journey uh, by finding a partner on the network. Uh, but really, pick the competency partners, because those are the ones we have vetted, the ones that you will have the most likelihood of success with. So I encourage you to make that as part of your buying process is to check, is this a competency partner? And we list them, like I showed you on the slide. You can find it on our website. You can find it in Marketplace, marked specially as competency as well. Um, and give us feedback, because one of the things that we take very, very uh, you know, seriously is customer input. When we are trying to decide if a partner solution you deployed is not working, tell us, and we will work with the partner to make sure they fix it. If there's a category that we are not we don't have enough partners in, or your favorite partner is not, doesn't have competency, tell us and we'll encourage them to go through the process and earn it so you can continue to sort of feel comfortable in using that solution. But really, it's very important that you give feedback to us, so I would really appreciate that. Beetle? Thanks, Ari. Thanks. Thank you. So again, Reinforcing what Rohit just said, uh, make sure that you're actually engaging with our partners. Uh, they're, they're here. You can visit them uh, at the Security Learning Hub. You can also see demos of any number of different solutions. And you can, you can speak with them. They're at the reception. They're not, just, you know, they're not just sponsoring things. They're here, and they're here to hear fee feedback from customers and help drive their actual feature roadmaps. So I'm going to reinforce everything that we've gone over, um, making sure that you understand uh, that your journey is going to begin with um, 
the landscape and understanding that and getting uh, the right coaching associated with that to begin that actual security journey. And again, best practices are not always labeled that way, right? Sometimes that advice is, it's obvious, but only when it's actually presented to us and from somebody else that's got a, a fresh view or has already solved something. So make sure that you're paying attention to the professional tips that others are offering. They're sharing their knowledge and their experience, and you should benefit from that, incorporate it into your workspace. And nobody's going to start off with all the resources that they'd like to have to solve all the things or do all the things that they'd like to do. And it's okay to seek out and actually bring in additional tools and talent to help augment what you already have and to achieve those security goals. So make sure that you're taking advantage of the coaching, the pro tips, the bench strength that's available to you so that you can actually achieve those security goals. Now, here are a couple extra picks that I threw in, things that I was interested in and that I think that uh, would be very interesting for you as well. Everything you wanted to know about compliance, but were afraid to ask. And so make sure you check that out tomorrow midday. And if you're looking for something a bit more aspirational and from one of my coworkers who helped start the AWS security team with me nine years ago, Eric Brandwine's giving a leadership session on aspirational security tomorrow as well. Now, as Steve announced this morning, we are launching a 10-city global security roadshow. Primary objective of this roadshow is to educate our customers around the world on security and compliance with hands-on content, and it's delivered by local security experts. Now, these are smaller events, and they're free. And there's more information available to you there at that bit.ly link. So thank you very much for attending this particular presentation. Make sure you go and enjoy a number of other ones and enjoy the conference. Really appreciate you showing up and make sure you fill out your surveys. We appreciate the feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers too.